I'd like to um, talk to you about the integration of mechanical kinetic energy recovery uh, systems with the vehicle drive line. I'll also mention you know, how this differs from the integration with electric, because uh, obviously a lot of you might be more familiar with electric kinetic energy recovery type devices. And I'll explain the interaction between the two, and in fact how I might expect in the future the two to be used together. Um, I've got a short introduction to my company, a bit about the state of the art of kinetic energy recovery today, and then I'd like to spend more time at the end talking about where I believe it's going to go, you know, what my vision for the future is, of, you know, how I think we can do a better job of capturing all of the energy that would otherwise be wasted in the vehicle and using it to give us the sort of uh, attributes in the vehicle that we would like to see in the future. So the Toro Track Group that I work for now, it's, uh, it's a publicly uh, listed company, PLC, on the London Stock Exchange, um, formed in 1998. Uh, it's famous for being a world uh, leading developer of traction drive technology, um, but also now the mechanical flywheel based technology uh, after the acquisition of Flybrid. Um, we've got a very extensive uh, IP portfolio and we've licensed our technology around the world. We've got a very capable um, engineering team. Uh, there's We're over at uh, well, eight, over our two sites, one in Silverstone where uh, Flybrid was originally based and one in Leyland in Lancashire, um, we've got a, a big group of engineers and we've got a full service provision. We do everything in the um, devices, so for, for example on the CURS it's not just batteries or electric motors or power electronics you might buy from separate places, we make everything uh, in the device, including all the controls and electronics as well as the hydraulics and the, you know, and the mechanical bits. In our Toro Track product portfolio, we've got um, infinitely variable transmissions, uh, we've got flywheel kinetic energy recovery systems, we've also got a variable supercharging device, um, which and all of these play into the uh, green uh, market, if you like, for automotive. But we're going to talk today about kinetic energy recovery, um, and we're particularly going to talk about flywheel based technologies. And in our flywheel kinetic energy recovery systems, we are using the flywheel to do the energy storage, so there's no batteries, no high voltage electric. The flywheel you see here is made of steel and carbon fibre, it's about this big, 200 millimetres in diameter, for, an, for a full size saloon car weighs about 5 kilos and spins it up to 60,000 <coughs> RPM. And we connect this to the vehicle wheels using a thing we, called a clutch, we call a clutched flywheel transmission, this is a transmission of our own um, invention and uh, patent protected and here we're using three um, small clutches wet multi-plate clutches that are normally open um, so like the clutch in a motorcycle and you squeeze them with hydraulic pressure to transmit the drive through them in a continuous slip so the, the clutch never grips solid um, you you're picking you can see uh, the gears connected to the three clutches are three different sizes, so they're rotating at different speeds. When you want to transmit energy to the flywheel, you look at those clutches with a, your computer, decide which one has got the least amount of slip across it, but with the wheel side going faster than the flywheel side, squeeze that clutch and start speeding up the flywheel. Um, and when it gets to one-to-one, -one, or just before it gets to one-to-one, -to -one, you swap to the next gear, um, and then swap again to the next gear, all by computer control. You can seamlessly blend between the two, blending out of one and into the other. There's no torque interruption, um, and the computer can do this fully automatically. It doesn't sound brilliantly efficient. Um, you, you know, a lot of you think might think about slipping clutch uh, as in the normal useful one in a car when you're pulling away from zero. But in that case, of course, when the car's doing zero uh, miles an hour and the engine's revving, as you first start to engage the clutch, the efficiency is zero, um, and uh, and it turns to 100% when the clutch is gripped solid. So you've got an average efficiency of 50%. But in our device, both sides of the clutch are always rotating, and the efficiency is only governed by the speed difference across it. So if there's a 20% speed difference across it, the uh, the loss is 20%. Um, so in fact, it becomes a pretty efficient device if you set the gears up right. You've put your gear ratios in the right place. You've covered the uh, you know the range of speeds that's necessary between flywheel and wheels properly with the gearbox design. You can make this round trip efficiency well over 65 percent. We have got we've got one product we'd run at 88 uh, percent. Depends how many gears you've got. 
I'd like to look at one state-of-the-art um, application. This is the first product coming to market with our um, device, and in fact the bus um, you can hear exclusively here is uh, heading down to the customer uh, next week for uh, entry into service. Um, this is a parallel hybrid energy recovery system we're applying first to bus and truck. Um, we are <coughs> proposing this as a cost-effective, low-risk route to improving fuel economy um, and reducing CO2 and particulate emissions. Particularly it's applicable to city buses and uh, the right bus street light here is the first application. But it's suitable for rural buses, delivery trucks, refuse collection vehicles and the like. And I would really point out Lots of people think kinetic energy recovery is only effective in stop-start conditions in city centres, and that's not true. Um, that's only true of the very low power electric things, because once you get out into real world and you break harder, it can't do anymore. It's only got a very low rating. Our systems with very high power um, work equally well on dual carriageways breaking into big roundabouts. And you should always remember that one stop from 40 miles an hour has got the same amount of kinetic energy in it as four stops from 20 miles an hour. Um, so the stops might be few and far between, but if they're from high speed, there's lots and lots of energy in them. And uh, when we've tested our system in real world use, our chief development engineer who lives, um, he lives in Ardley on the M40 and we're based at Silverstone. His journey to work is all on the A43. It's all dual carriageway. He's only got one, about 140 yards that's not dual carriageway on this whole way to work. And we thought, well, it won't be very good on his journey to work. It's fantastic. Saved him 32% of his fuel. And it all came from four big stops into roundabouts at Brackley, going around the Brackley bypass. Um, and because you can capture, capture all of his energy when you can store your, uh, your kinetic energy at 80 horsepower. So in the bus, um, I'll show you the setup of this. The kinetic energy recovery system is fitted in the vehicle next to the um, gearbox. In fact, in this picture it is, you can see a, a small hatch removed just behind the rear wheel. That is where the Kurs device is. So it's behind the rear wheel, the engine is hanging out the back of a bus, as you might be familiar. And it is a parallel hybrid, separately connected to the rear differential, um, so not interfering at all with a conventional powertrain on the vehicle, uh, with the engine or the gearbox or any of those components. And if we um, have a closer look at what we've got here, we've got a power takeoff with a, a 1.8 to 1 ratio. Um, we're feeding uh, the energy into the flywheel there which has got a, a rating of 600 kilojoules of storage and 120 kilowatts of power. Um, we can generate 5,000 newton meters at the tyre um, and we've got a service life of 1 million kilometres or more than 42,000 hours of storage or 8 million storage and discharge cycles and we have run um, a full million kilometre life on the first uh, duty cycle we're going to be going to, to into service on in Gillingham in Kent. <coughs> And we're expecting to do that live without any significant replacement parts, just an oil service, basically. If we look closer at the device, <coughs> um, you can see the flywheel's position behind the big plate on the right-hand side there. The containment, is, uh, the containment system you can see would retain all the bits of the flywheel if anything went wrong inside. I should be clear, we've never broken one. We haven't broken one ever below 56,000 revs, and we haven't broken one at all since 2009 and it's really, really hard to break them even when you try. Um, <coughs> if you look inside that device, this is what's inside. The flywheel on the right-hand side that's set inside the containment. Behind it, six um, high-speed rotating clutches rated at 230 Newton meters okay. each, and then the gear train that brings the drive out to uh, connect to the uh, vehicle wheels. Those six clutches, they're arranged in two sets of three. You can have any of the three that are flywheel connected with any of the three that are wheel speed connected. That gives you nine gear ratios effectively. So it's a nine speed automatic gearbox um, and it's controlled uh, you know, fully by computer and, and hydraulics. So whilst a lot of people might look at Flybrid and think we're a flywheel company, the flywheel bit is a tiny bit of what we do. We're an automatic transmissions company um, and the flywheel bit is basically fully sorted and, and you know, the least trouble of any of the bits we have now, frankly. On the outside of the device and turning it round, you can see the hydraulic manifold at the bottom that has, contains all the hydraulic valves that control its operation. We're using the same hydraulic valves you'd find in a, a regular um, DCT-type road car transmission, so they're automotive standard bits. 
Um, the GERS control unit is made to our specification by a, a, an existing supplier and we write all the software that sits inside there. So when, when connecting this type of um, device to your drivetrain, first of all you've got to remember that the torque uh, in all of the driveline connections is, is bidirectional. So however much power we can store with, we can return to the wheels with. Uh, so where you might have been used to modifying the gear design on your differential so that you could make it quiet under high load, um, that often means you've uh, slightly uh, biased the profile of the gear teeth in one particular direction to make it quiet under load. We don't really want you to do that. Um, we also don't really like uh, high point gears which don't uh, work so efficiently in reverse direction. Um, and so you can, might start thinking about you know, really all these bits need to be bi-directional and what, what might I do differently to, um, you know, to make them uh, work more efficiently. We don't really like bevel gears with a big ratio across them either. We might prefer to do the bevel at one to one and have the drop, you know, drop on a straight pair of gears um, where we've got free choice and we build, um, you know, we're making the diff. We would make it that way if we, you know, if we could do that. One of the key things about our system is that we have to um, run the bits very fast. We're looking for very powerful systems in a, quite a small space. This means we want a low torque and to do that we run the bits very quick. We have run clutches at 38,000 RPM. Um, in, the, in the road vehicles and in the bus it's slower than that but they're still you know, what you would consider pretty fast. Um, this gives us sometimes some challenges on noise, you know, and let's be clear, the gear that's on the end of the flywheel shaft has to do flywheel speed. So, you know, on, on the road car system, 60,000 RPM is a fast gear, um, and we do have to be careful about noise, but that absolutely can be overcome. It's just, you have to recognize the challenge and do something about it. We've developed, um, lubrication, cooling and hydraulic systems that all use the same fluid. Um, we don't want to have more than more pumps than are necessary, more filters than are necessary, more coolers than are necessary. Um, so we're running all of those systems off a common fluid. Uh, we have to be careful about aeration. We have to, uh, you know, obviously aeration might be f fully acceptable in the lubrication system, but it's not acceptable in hydraulics. Um, so you have to be careful about foaming. You might have to look for anti-foaming additives in the fluids and things like this. We have to worry about parasitic losses. Um, parasitic losses are very, very important. Uh, interesting, you know, Sam, Sam mentioned that uh, he's been involved in looking at parasitic losses on CVTs. Again, a very, very important subject close to our heart at Tour Track. Um, but on these things, those parasitic losses need to be low. When you turn the device on, immediately, it has some losses, you know, there are bits rotating, but also we've got um, lubrication, hydraulic, we've got a vacuum pump, the flywheel runs in a, an evacuated chamber and we run our own pump on board, and it draws 34 watts and only runs one minute, <coughs> one minute in 20 or so, so it's not a very big loss, but nevertheless, there's something there. We also have to be very careful about drag on open clutches. Um, we said we had six clutches in the bus system, um, at any one time one will be shut, one will be slipping and four will be open so the drag across those open clutches again they're not um, they haven't got zero speed on one side both sides are rotating so the losses are much lower than you think but still they're not zero and we have to do our best to get those to zero so you know mechanisms for separating the plates properly making sure you spin any fluid out of them properly um, we filed patents on uh, how you control the lubrication and cooling of those clutches to minimise drag when they're open. We, um, we might also think about what's happening to all that energy. If you thought about what was happening to the energy at the brakes, um, you, were, you used to be getting rid of a huge amount of energy through the brake. We don't have to get rid of all that energy. Obviously most of it ends up in the flywheel and then comes back to the wheels and never gets dissipated at all. So the vehicle has massively reduced its heat, overall heat rejection. Um, the, the energy that's dissipated to the uh, fluid in the, 
in the clutches is a pretty small proportion of the overall amount of energy that was captured by the curs. Um, so, you know, we've got a, a, a sensibly small cooler uh, on the on the bus. It's about that big, um, and it runs at a nice hot temperature, oil temperature, 100 degrees C, um, good delta T to air. It's uh, you know, and we haven't got any cooling issues. Quite easy to manage. Might also consider that you now don't have to dissipate as much energy to the brakes. You can reduce brake cooling. Um, maybe you can run a closed wheel design with better aero drag or something like this that might gain some other benefits on the vehicle. I've shown you a picture of where we are with the bus and you know of a system that is completely parallel and not integrated with the gearbox and there's loads of reasons why this is a good first entry point into the market. Bus and truck market is, is a tricky place where they are then most vehicle manufacturers like bus for example our client they don't make engines they don't make gearboxes they buy off the shelf things that are available making it in this way means it's possible for them to add it in relatively quickly and easily and get to market but for sure it would be better if you could build it into the gearbox and it would be better for a number of reasons firstly if you can connect the system to a shaft with a higher speed than the diff it, we would have a load less gears in our in our bit. You know, there are a load of gears involved in in just getting the the overall gear ratio between tyre and flywheel. You know, on a on a typical road car, that gear ratio in our maximum ratio of CFT would be more than seven hundred to one. Um, you know, if you could be connected to somewhere that was going three times faster, it would only be a couple of hundred to one, which would be a lot better. So it would have less gear losses, less components, less weight less cost altogether better so it would be it would also be better if we could connect to a shaft that had a narrower speed range than the wheel <coughs> so if you're connected engine input shaft side of the gearbox then you would have a you could use the whole gearbox range you could have a much narrower speed range we, we maybe then don't need six clutches maybe we only need three delete a load of bits delete a load of cost and weight and all the other things that go with it It is possible to connect the curves to the lay shaft of manual gearbox and achieve these functions. Um, in fact, all of our racing programs we've done today, uh, we've been we had the first ever hybrid car, for example, to race at Le Mans. Um, that was built in this way. Uh, with this con configuration, you can also start to do some other things. At the moment, on the bus, we can only do kinetic energy recovery. Um, we can't start the engine when the engine's stationary. Um, we, you know. There's a, there's a number of functionalities that we can do. We can drive the bus with the engine turned off, um, but uh, you know there's some other things you might like to do that you can't do where we're fitted. But if you are connected to the input shaft of the gearbox, you must turn the curves off when you change gear. Obviously, we've got the inertia of a big flywheel and all the gears attached to it, and if you wanted to shift the uh, dog ring of a gearbox across into the next gear, you won't be able to do that with this huge inertia attached. But um, you know, on our racing programs, uh, the cars have got paddle shift gearboxes with very sharp fast shift times, 35 milliseconds or so, and we don't interrupt the, you know, we don't slow them down. Um, we turn off in nine milliseconds and back on in 12 to 13, um, and we can, you know, respect their gear shift window and not get in the way. So it's it's not a problem. But of course, there is a torque interruption at the tyre when you do that. 35 milliseconds is quite short, but. Um, you know, but there is one, and this is what that might you know that arrangement might look like. We might um, connect the system to the end of the lay shaft, and as shown here, then then it might only have three sets of clutches. Um, you know, one small gear train between uh, us and you know between the clutches and the flywheel, and then the flywheel itself. This is a much smaller, lighter thing. You can imagine this sat on top of the gearbox in a front-wheel drive transverse engine car. Um, you know, next to the engine out of the way from a crash point of view, pretty much in line with the end of the engine, set on top of the gearbox. Um, this is a nice application, it's the right way to do it for low cost, low weight, um, and for really good levels of performance. And you know, in this sort of package size and shape, 30 kilowatts, 60 kilowatts, whatever you like, 100 if you want, it's not a problem on, on performance. Control is an interesting thing, as I said, at um, at Torotrack we write our own control systems um, 
and we have a number of important challenges to manage when we come to integrate kinetic energy recovery with the car. Particularly, we need to integrate with the foundation brakes for a smooth and seamless transition. Um, we obviously have to uh, turn the curves on at uh, you know when the driver first presses the brake pedal. We'd like the brakes to come on quickly. You know when you press, press the pedal, you'd kind of like the brakes to come on, and you need a, you need to get them on in a couple of hundred milliseconds, or the driver will notice. You also need to be able to blend out of the curves smoothly as you get towards low speed. Obviously we have a minimum gear ratio in our gearbox. There is a speed below which we can't store any more, any more energy. Um, that's when, you know, in our very, in the gear ratio that gives you the lowest car speed, highest flywheel speed, when the flywheel is getting up towards 60,000 and the car's getting to typically about eight kilometers an hour, um, we run out of gear ratio and you have to stop doing storage. At that point, we need to blend back to the brakes smoothly and you know, not let the driver know that he was using kinetic energy recovery. We do need to manage the inertia of all the driveline bits. Um, whenever we change gear, uh, you are um, decelerating something or accelerating something within our own system, and particularly on the, the nine-speed gearbox that's in the bus, there's an intermediate set of gears between one set of clutches and the other. And during some of the um, gear shifts, when you're changing gear shift on the wheel side bit, you need to sometimes accelerate the gears that sit between the two. And the energy it takes to accelerate those gears needs to be taken into account so that you get a beautifully smooth transition without any um, torque interruption and without any torque fluctuation. We've got that beautifully controlled. You know, it's it's pretty easy to calculate and. Uh, you know, we, we achieve very, very smooth transitions between those, but you, you know, there's an important element to take into account there. And remember that, in fact, when we spin those bits up, they are doing energy storage. Um, you know, just because it wasn't in the flywheel doesn't mean we didn't store it. You can have back what's in the shafts too. Which is an interesting point, if you ever go to do kinetic energy recovery sums, by the way, um, everybody does half MV squared for the car, almost nobody does the inertia of all the rotating bits like the wheels. It's quite a big number, worth a look. Um, we need to be very careful about which auxiliary functions are turned off when we're, not in, you know, when we're not trying to use it. So if you're cruising down the motorway, we'd like to turn off as much as possible. Uh, obviously you don't want to uh, apply any extra parasitic loss to the, um, uh, to the vehicle, but you need to be careful about how you do that so that when you do press the brake pedal at the top of the exit ramp, the brakes come on. And obviously we need to communicate with the vehicle over the, over the CAN network. We need to do uh, talk down requests when we're delivering talk um, because obviously we need to be able to blend out the, the flywheel recovery and blend back in the engine smoothly without any uh, you know, torque discontinuity at the tyre. Um, and of course if you, if you gave the driver, especially in the bus actually, if you give the driver the flywheel on top of the engine, he loves it. Um, but he goes faster and he doesn't save much fuel. So I said I'd like to um, give you a, a view of where I think the future direction of cars are going and um, it's an interesting thing this. I'm, I, I find myself in an interesting uh, space with, with cars of the future. I really believe that um, cars need to be fun, they need to be fast, uh, they need to make you excited, they need to get you your uh, heart involved in buying the car it's not only about your head um, and I, you know I'm not one for imagining the future's full of really tiny downsized cars that are going to be gutless that's that's no fun for me but what I do think we can do is separate the requirement to accelerate the car from the ex from the requirement to cruise in it because um, you know we've uh, we did a flower hybrid program with our friends from Jaguar Land Rover who sadly uh, have, have, have left already but um, when you look at a, a Jaguar XF you know to cruise a Jaguar XF at 70 miles an hour on a motorway takes about 22 horsepower um, to drive it uphill 8% gradient at 70 75 80 miles an hour you know the sort of worst case cruising consideration 50 horsepower is plenty um, yet we buy cars with 250 horsepower it's five times too big the engine um, and it's five times too big just because you want the good 0-60 time. Well, I'm saying 
I don't think you need to do that and we can separate the requirement to accelerate the car from that which allows them to uh, cruise and we call our solution to this uh, big flywheel small engine. Basically what we're suggesting is that when you look at, I mean this graph's for a smaller car, this is for a B-class car, um, you can see the acceleration peaks where you might need 40, 45 uh, kilowatts but the, the regular base load is of the order of 30 um, and we're suggesting that if you fitted a 100 kilowatt flywheel system and a 30 kilowatt prime mover you can have a car that does 0 to 60 in well less than 8 seconds with 130 kilowatts. Um, in our simulations and we've done a proper job of this using all the right data from the car manufacturer we can get to below 70 grams of CO2 um, we can get below 70 grams even on the more aggressive drive cycles like uh, USFTP or WLTC as well um, and the vehicle would really genuinely drive properly and you know accelerate really hard whenever you wanted but it has got a cap to maximum speed um, so basically we're saying go as quick as you like to 80 miles an hour or so and then, you, then it'll hit a brick wall um, <coughs> We think this is a really appropriate way to go. You can produce really exciting, fast cars, um, yet you know, deliver fantastic CO2 results. And this car is not expensive to make, really not expensive at all. It's about a thousand euros more expensive to make than a car of today. Um, you know, nothing <coughs> like the cost of electric hybrid equivalents. <coughs> But when you start to talk about higher power devices like this, it offers some other things. Um, with this solution we believe you can start to consider the deletion of foundation brakes on the driven axle. Um, we have built a car uh, that has 80% of its brakes done by flywheel curves. Um, drives really well. It goes really well. Um, <coughs> and. You know, this, we believe this is a proper, genuine, mass scale solution to the challenge that we're facing because, as the JLR guys rightly said, you know, the longer term future will not have a very large mix of electric vehicles in it and we do have to find out how to do this with petrol, diesel and synthetic gasoline, I would suggest, or you know, methanol type uh, fuels. So when you do this, um, 100 kilowatts produces a, a lot of braking effort in normal use. Um, to produce 100 kilowatts, you've got to brake, brake pretty hard, even in a, in a even in quite a heavy car. Um, the flywheel obviously needs enough energy to be able to accelerate the car from zero to 80 miles an hour. So it'll have 30% spare capacity when coming back down if it's got 70% round trip efficiency. Um, any um, excess of energy, you know, if you're running down a long hill and you think you might run out of flywheel storage, there's all sorts of things you can do to burn a bit of energy without having to worry about running out of flywheel capacity. Um, it's very easy, for example, in the software to maintain a map that says when I'm doing 40 miles an hour, the amount <coughs> of energy I need left in the flywheel to get me to zero is X. You know, half mv squares, a nice simple sum. Um, so you know when you get to the point when you have to start burning something very simply um, and then you can choose to do things you know obviously the vehicle should have stop in drive as we call it and I saw Jerome uh, Mortal talking about the clutch systems sailing and coasting turning off the engine disconnecting all those driveline losses when the vehicles in the overrun for sure you should be doing that um, but you can choose to re-engage it with the fuel injectors turned off and you can put it back on in any gear you like so you can waste you can waste quite a lot of energy that way if you want to. <coughs> the other thing we can do, we can put up our parasitic losses very straightforwardly. We've got con electronic control of our pressure relief valves on lubrication flow and things like that. We can just turn them up. Um, and we can also slip two, FC two CFT clutches against each other, basically in two different gear ratios. And that's basically what our proposal is uh, for what you do when you get down to eight kilometres an hour. From eight kilometres to zero, we'll, we'll just slip two against each other. The energy doesn't go to the flywheel, it just gets dissipated in the clutch. But by then, the amount of absolute energy in kilojoules to dissipate is very small. Um, <coughs> so we can bring it fully to rest using our control. Um, 
and we can just hold them shut to keep it there. And one of the things to remember here, um, you know, our clutch sizing and the, you know, we'd like the bits to rotate quick and all of that, so the, the clutches um, are sized in a particular way. But you can make sure that all the braking gets dissipated across any one of them. So you might have, uh, you know, th three small ones and one big one, uh, and you lock one of these and slip this one to, uh, you know, slip the big one to dissipate the last bit of energy. As an extra bonus, which is that, um, there's no brake dust emitted to the world, and uh, for what it's worth, uh, on buses for sure, after particulate emission from diesel on Euro 5, the next biggest emission is brake dust, um, which won't particularly surprise you next time you wash your car, have a look at how black the front wheels are. Uh, sorry. And so, with... Sorry, did I... Uh, that last one for me. Sorry, yeah. So, a um, couple of considerations about this. First of all, cars have got foundation brakes driven by your leg because your leg's stronger than your hand. Um, as soon as brakes are by wire, it doesn't have to be your leg anymore. PlayStation console, whatever you like. Um, maybe you can move the pedals, get them out of the way of crash and your feet. Uh, all sorts of other things you might think about doing. I really like um, some of the other safety functionality that comes from um, one pedal cars particularly dead man's handle, um, have a heart attack on the motorway, brake just, you know, vehicle just applies, um, the brakes automatically and stops as quickly as it can, uh, should be a legal requirement in my view, that probably come anyway, I'm sure you can do it with conventional brakes too, um, and uh, you know, once you start to think about what brake by wire means, you might think about a whole different way of controlling your car. So for my last slide, I'd just like to say, I think curse functionality, whether it's provided electrically or mechanically, is going to provide a range of new challenges for driveline engineers. Uh, I'm sure none of you are in favour of in-wheel motors, because that would probably delete the gearbox. Um, but uh, <coughs> you know, I don't believe vehicles are going to get slower or less powerful just because they emit less CO2. Um, you know, a thousand horsepower road car is not dead yet. Um, probably will see a two thousand horsepower one in my lifetime. Maybe within ne within the next ten years, um, you're going to see increasingly larger torque requirements placed on the transmission, and particularly in the reverse direction. Um, we're expecting all the energy transfer um, that used to go to the brakes to come to the uh, kinetic energy recovery system. We think drive lines are going to get more complicated, more expensive, while braking <coughs> systems get less powerful, ultimately tending to deletion. And. Uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Any questions?